Hello everyone and welcome to the top two considerations for operating in the cloud. Today's webinar is sponsored by Red Hat and produced by Actual Tech Media. I'm one of those Actual Tech Media folks. In fact, my name is Keith Ward. I'm really happy to be your moderator for this special event today. Now, before we get to the content, there are some housekeeping items you need to know. First up, uh, we encourage any and all questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. That's also a place to let us know where you're logging in from. And it's great to see people from all over today. You are here from California, from Illinois, from LA. I don't know if that's Los Angeles or uh, Louisiana. It could be either, I guess. We've got people from Texas, Jackson, Mississippi, Arizona, St. Louis, Missouri, South Carolina. Um, Maryland, my neck of the woods, Michigan, uh, Virginia, Wisconsin, and uh, so good to see everyone here today. Happy that you could make it with us or make it to make it here uh, with us. Now, that Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues you might be experiencing. First thing you wanna do if you have any problems is refresh your browser. That should fix most things. If that doesn't work, refresh that browser again. How about that? Uh, and if that still doesn't work, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll try some other stuff. Um, all right, in the handout section, of your webinar control panel. That's the little tab right next to you, the questions tab in that box. Uh, you will find a number of great and important resources that you should be checking out. Most especially today, take a look at the two free handouts from Red Hat. They are a couple of PDFs, the total, econo the total economic impact of Red Hat OpenShift Cloud Services is one, and the other is called Save Costs and Achieve More with Red Hat OpenShift Managed Services. Download both of those now, why don't you? Other handouts include a link to the Gorilla Guide Book Club where you can get access to our vast library of printed resources on technology topics. You will also find there a link to the Actual Tech Media Events Center, which has our calendar of upcoming events. We have some great shows coming up. So see what attracts you and sign up today. Finally, at the end of this event, we will be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant, which could be you. Um, as you do have to be uh, present for the entire event to be eligible to win that gift card. So stick around. Uh, if you want to see the official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing, you can also find that in the handout section for some really exciting reading. Uh, and with that, Let's dive into it, or why don't we? All right, it is truly my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today, who is Stu Miniman, Director of Market Insights, Hybrid Platforms for Red Hat. I have known Stu for many years, and he's always great to listen to. He is ready to go. So, Stu, take it away. I'll see everyone on the other side of Stu's presentation the Director of Market Insights at Red Hat, and I want to welcome you to Powering Innovation and AppDev Symposium. I'm going to be talking to you about two top considerations for operating in the cloud. So in the session today, I'm going to start with some of the top concerns. I meet with lots of companies out there, and there are very specific things I hear from them, especially as we talk about their journey for the cloud. Um, the cloud ecosystems, the cloud native landscape is going through a tremendous amount of changes. There's so much complexity, uh, so much innovation. How do we tap into that? How do we help uh, really get our arms around so much that is there and make sure that I can turn it into an opportunity rather than uh, a challenge for our teams? Uh, important thing we're going to talk about is your resources and how we make sure to align them properly to get the best use out of them. And going to share uh, so some patterns of success. Uh, you know, luckily we've been going on this journey for a number of years, so there's things that we know, uh, so, some things that work, and some anti-patterns that we want to make sure that we avoid. So let's get right into it. Uh, you know, 
companies across the globe, across lots of different industries, have lots of challenges. And everybody, of course, has very specific things for your business, your organization, technologies that you've used, skill sets that you have, challenges that you face both internally and with the competition. But if I can boil it down, almost every company out there have two very similar top concerns. The first one, uh, what our, our friends at uh, Amazon Web Services call job zero is security. So every company, uh, no matter who you are, uh, whether you're a supplier of technology into the space, a consumer of technology, uh, a uh, you know one of the, the channel or integrators there, security really is everyone's responsibility, something we all need to think about. Uh, it, it's something that uh, really is pervasive uh, here at Red Hat. Um, everything that we do, uh, we, we think about how security fits into the overall discussion. And we've been helping customers for a number of years, uh, things like DevSecOps and ShiftLeft, uh, looking at the secure supply chain uh, these days are, are all top issues and, and something we'll discuss further uh, during this presentation. Uh, the second one, uh, it has been highlighted even more uh, in the last couple of years in the, in the pandemic, but how do I make sure I find the right people? How do I hire them? How do I make sure they have the right skill set? And how do we retain them? Uh, so, you know, the, this journey cloud has been uh, a great boon uh, for uh, for many. Uh, it has helped drive a lot of careers. I sure have had a lot of fun uh, working in this space uh, for, for a number of years, uh, but there are also the challenges there. There is always... Uh, a fight that we all have to, you know, get the right skill set, retain those people. And there is a, a battle out there uh, for some key pieces. So something that we want to think about often is how are we making sure that we have an environment? How are we uh, ha going to have an environment where we, we can attract and retain uh, the, the people that we need to be successful going forward? Um, when we look at cloud in general, so uh, at Red Hat, we've been talking about the hybrid cloud for more than a decade. Um, whether you call it hybrid cloud, whether you call it multi-cloud, uh, there, there are lots of terms out there. But, you know, most companies, especially if you've been around for, for a while, you have your own data centers. You might have some hosted data centers. You're absolutely, you know, to some point leveraging public cloud or multiple public cloud environments and edge environments come into this. Uh, I wrote an ebook uh, last year talking about hybrid cloud, and in many ways, companies reached it by accident. It was either different groups in the companies made different decisions. Uh, we were covering some of the same patterns that we had done in the data center, which is, hey, each application, we need to think about all its requirements on its own and, and configure everything properly. Maybe there were merger and acquisitions uh, that, that brought us into other environments, but we kind of ended up in this by accident and we wanna be more strategic as to how we think about this. Um, this the, the promise of a cloud was hopefully to make things simpler uh, and to, to help with the overall expenses. Um, it can do that if done properly, but if we don't plan for it and we don't really understand how to take advantage of these new environments. If we do things the way that we used to in the new environment, we can end up actually costing more money, spending more resources, having more uh, that our people need to do in all of these environments. And uh, as I note at the bottom of the slide, you know, there are those security issues uh, and, uh, you know, the overall talent issues, of course, are, are issues that we want to think about. Um, and want to be really cognizant of as, as we're building and architecting solutions, it's not just the, the day one rollout, but how am I going to maintain, how am I going to, you know, sustain the activity. Uh, general rule I, I think about, uh, I used to have some operations roles and, you know, the question is, will I have more or less on my plate next year? Uh, the answer is usually more. Um, so what are the things that I can stop doing? What are the things I can automate myself out of? Or what are the things I can turn to software or platforms to be able to shift uh, some of the, the burden and toil of, of those activities uh, to, to others? Um, We've done lots of research on this, done lots of surveys. We, we talked to our, our customers. So uh, here, here's the note, 73.5% of technology leaders are outsourcing the implementation, maintenance, and optimization of their cloud platforms. I wanna be careful when we talk about outsourcing. So 
outsourcing, if we think about previous generations of outsourcing was how can I take my mess and get it for less to allow someone else to do it? When we talk about outsourcing today, uh, we're really talking about shifting to things like cloud services. How do I have managed offerings? Just as SaaS has become very pervasive in the marketplace, um, I, as an enterprise, typically do not need to roll out my own email or deploy servers when I'm doing things like CRM. I'm using Microsoft Office or the Google Suite for email, uh, or I'm using Salesforce or one of uh, the, the alternatives uh, in the SaaS world uh, for things like CRM. So that is where I can consume technology rather than having to build and maintain uh, everything around it. In the cloud native ecosystem, so containers and Kubernetes have been a huge boon to how we build solutions, uh, build some consistency across uh, different environments, but the cloud native computing landscape, if you haven't seen, if you go to the CNCF website, they have this wonderful landscape and it breaks down hundreds of open source projects into various categories. And there's phenomenal innovation, there's so many different things that I can take advantage of um, and many companies that are helping uh, to, to make it easier to deploy. But it, it has reached almost a meme uh, in the industry so much that someone actually created a uh, puzzle uh, out of the CNCF landscape. And the joke was, oh boy, it's gonna be really fun getting all those pieces, lining everything up. Everything looks kind of homogenous and uh, the same. But you know, all jokes aside, the CNCF landscape is a wonderful thing. The ecosystem uh, are building phenomenal technologies, but the challenge for all of us we reach is that paradox of choice. Um, how do I curate, integrate, and maintain all of those pieces? Well, this is something that Red Hat knows a thing or two about. So Red Hat, we are an open source company when it comes to how we, uh, how we developed software. So uh, as our CEO often says, we are an enterprise software company with an open source development model. So that chaos out there of constantly new projects, communities changing things, uh, you know, lines of code changing at an amazing pace, that is where Red Hat has decades of experience. And if we look in this cloud native ecosystem, Red Hat is a very active participant in these projects. So there are hundreds of projects that we are part of. If I look in the cloud native computing uh, ecosystem, uh, there are over 50 projects where we are quite active uh, in the overall uh, discussion. Um, and we are either creators of the technology, we are driving some of the technology, um, or you know, we have committed some significant code to it. And a few things that you get out of that. One is we've built a platform. Kubernetes by itself uh, has very limited capability. There are lots of things that you would think come along with this, things like logging and monitoring uh, and the like. Uh, on this slide, you see uh, lots of different logos for various pieces uh, to be able to make it easier uh, to build applications, manage the overall experience and is something that OpenShift is Kubernetes and a lot more. Um, so there's many pieces of that. And secondly, uh, a concern I often get is, hey, there's so many projects out there. Who's really working on this? How do I know that that project will be there uh, in the coming months? Well, if Red Hat has put this into our product, uh, that means that there's a commitment from Red Hat that we will continue to participate in it. and. Most of these projects that we are involved in, it's not just Red Hat alone. There are many other peers in the industry that are helping us to drive this overall technology um, and help uh, really gain value from uh, the wisdom of all of our peers. And th th that is a key point. Uh, Red Hat with OpenShift, we now have you know years of experience, thousands of customers that have deployed their enterprise workloads in production, and that helps you uh, focus on what's important to your business. We're talking about out dev at this event. Um, that is the whole reason that we have these platforms. My background is heavily in infrastructure. Uh, I, I'm networking by background, spent many years in the virtualization world. Uh, infrastructure's whole role is to be the place where my applications live, where I can gain, unlock value from the data uh, that we have along there. And that's, that's what we're building. And that's what all of these projects, when they come together, help us do. Uh, 
I talked a little bit about security. So containers, Kubernetes, we need to make sure that security is an integral part of what we're doing. So hopefully you're well familiar with DevOps and the DevSecOps movement. Uh, security must be something that we think about throughout the entire process. Uh, often we talk about things like ship left. So when we're building, packaging, deploying, running, going through the entire cycle of our development, security is a piece of it. Um, Red Hat has a long history uh, from the Linux standpoint uh, to make sure we have done things to make sure uh, that we are as secure as possible. We've done the same things when we built OpenShift. Uh, we made an acquisition a little over a year ago of a company, Stackrox, uh, which has helped us build Kubernetes native security, uh, which we have as an offering that we can build into what we do. So strong focus on security, not only what Red Hat does, the overall community there, I mentioned secure supply chain is part of the ongoing effort that we and others in the open source communities are doing uh, to make sure that the, the, the code is secure, any vulnerabilities that are found uh, are, are quickly addressed. And it is where open source has really done quite well is that speed to react helps us with the overall security posture. Uh, and what Red Hat has been doing for a long time is not only do we help make sure that things are as secure as possible, but if there are issues that are found, we can actually do backporting from the Linux, from the Kubernetes standpoint to make sure that you don't necessarily have to upgrade uh, to the latest version to take advantage uh, of, uh, of the patching that needs to be done. All right, so I've been talking rather high level on things, ju just to share from a Red Hat standpoint, the portfolio that we look at, uh, OpenShift software, is something we've been shipping for a long time. Uh, we, we recently released 4.11 um, uh, and OpenShift has been leveraging Kubernetes really since Kubernetes 1.0, since before that we started working on it. Um, but it is, as I said, Kubernetes and then those dozens of projects that we pull into it. So OpenShift can be deployed as software where you, you have the software that Red Hat provides and you're responsible for the installation uh, and management support of that over environment. And we also have uh, cloud services. So in partnership with the hyperscalers, uh, many years ago, we launched what is called OpenShift Dedicated, a solution that is purchased from Red Hat, built by Red Hat, supported by Red Hat, uh, and we have done partnerships with uh, a number of the cloud providers. So uh, Azure was the first one uh, about four years ago uh, that we launched the Azure Red Hat OpenShift or Arrow. And about a year and a half, uh, we also launched the solution with Amazon, the Azure, Red, uh, I'm sorry, Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS or Rosa. So Rosa and Arrow, you purchase them from Amazon and Azure. It's part of their committed spend program. If you're participating in those, uh, it is in the console. So truly cloud native, just like the hundreds of other services that they run, which is different from the cloud marketplace, which is them just enabling third-party software. So we work closely with the engineering groups of those companies, the same group that do their Kubernetes offerings, work with us on those. Um, and we have more services that we do on it. In addition to uh, Amazon and Azure, we, we also have a similar offering uh, with, our, with our partners at IBM. So um, I talked uh, you know, briefly about security at a high level from a product standpoint, the acronyms I have on the left, the OpenShift Container Platform really builds that foundational la layer to make sure that we are secure. So with the foundation of what we do on Linux to make sure things are secure, we do the same thing at the Kubernetes and container layer. We have a solution, uh, the advanced cluster security for Kubernetes, which is that Stackrocks acquisition that I mentioned, as well as the advanced cluster manager for Kubernetes, which is our multi-cluster manager. So these are the software pieces that we build to help focus on security as you grow and scale your overall environments. Um, one of the things that sets OpenShift apart is the deep work that we do across all of these environments. So when I showed you OpenShift is software, OpenShift is cloud services, it is the same OpenShift everywhere, but there's a lot of engineering work that needs to go into making sure it works in all of those environments. In the data center, every customer has different environments and there's a lot of work to make sure that those 
uh, work properly and that we can support everything uh, that, that customers have uh, and support them. In a cloud, there are different challenges to make sure that we still allow access to those native services um, and keep up with the changes that are happening in a public cloud uh, th that are there. So. Back in the Linux world, uh, what we talked about for many years with, with Red Hat Enterprise Linux is a standard operating environment. And in many ways, we're doing the same thing with what we're doing with Kubernetes and OpenShift. So standardization gives you consistency for your developers, for your operators, and your security team, wherever they are. Yes, there is nuances and differences across those various environments. We don't have a magic button to uh, defy the laws of physics or to make all of the clouds the same. They are different. So if you are using services that are different between those clouds, portability is not necessarily uh, something that you can just press a button and move things between, but the APIs, the configurations, uh, the what your developers really work on at the OpenShift layer will give them consistency uh, so that they have uh, there is much less that they need to think about uh, when they're building their applications. Whereas if I was just using a solution on a single public cloud, and then we said, hey, you know, developer, we need you to go work on this other cloud, there, there's a much larger ramp up that they need to have uh, to be able to do what they're doing. So we want to be able to capitalize on the unique capabilities of each cloud um, and working closely in partnership with those uh, those suppliers to, to keep up with what they're doing and work deeply uh, with what we are there. So a key piece uh, when we talk about that, that skill set uh, that we talked about before, um, because the needs of the business will change and you want to be able to make it as easy as possible uh, for your team not to have to think about some of those underlying changes. If there is some reason you need to switch from one cloud to another, they, they will still be able to do much of what they've done. Um, and managing the overall environment, you have that consistency if you're using OpenShift across all of those environments, rather than having to build a bespoke team and resources with tooling uh, for each specific environment. Let's talk a little bit more about the cloud services of uh, themselves. So uh, we take care of a lot of what we kind of call the, the plumbing and electric, the underneath infrastructure pieces. You should be able to focus much more of your resources on building applications, doing things like governance and compliance, um, because uh, in, in that will accelerate the business that, that, that you're working on, whether you have an SRE team yourself, and just in case uh, SRE is a site reliability engineering team, or you don't have an SRE team, our service is run by an SRE team. So if you have an SRE team, that they are a very valuable resource and you wanna be able to make sure that you're getting the most value out of them, focus on things that are specific to your business. Um, and our SRE team can take care of that, that, that typical toil of managing the cluster, make sure we have good uptime, can deal with things like scalability, uh, and we're supporting a, a much broader set of the overall infrastructure than just Kubernetes itself. Um, there, there's a lot on this slide here, but just talk, talk about a couple of the pieces here. Um, that SRE team, uh, global SRE team that runs 24 seven and works across all of our environments. So uh, they actually learn things working in different clouds to make sure that you have the most robust solution overall. Um, if you were to purchase Kubernetes from one of the cloud providers, that is basically what we call a managed control plane. You are still responsible for the worker nodes. You need to configure all of that. Uh, from an OpenShift standpoint, since our SREs actually manage not only the control plane, but all of the worker nodes themselves, we can actually put an SLA behind that. So there you see a 99.95% financially backed SLA uh, behind it. So if we can spend more time taking care of the underlying pieces, your team can spend more time responding to the business, responding on the needs of your client, uh, accelerating growth uh, and, and building new capabilities, which is what you want to be able to take advantage of. Uh, I've talked quite a bit of, about the consistency of this, uh, but just to reinforce, this is truly a native offering. So it is in console. You never need to leave the Amazon Microsoft or IBM console itself to be able to run our service. 
Uh, we do, if you have OpenShift across many environments, we do have tooling that would allow you to manage across all of those. Um, and again, just like any other service from the cloud provider, you get the billing from them, you get visibility into all of your usage from them, uh, and we can tie into everything else that we have uh, from those cloud providers. And it is truly jointly engineered and jointly supported uh, between those companies. Just to show a little bit about OpenShift, if you ran it yourself versus the cloud provider. So obviously we're trying to do all we can to simplify the, the overall running of a cluster uh, with, with OpenShift, but this diagram shows some of the responsibilities of what we at Red Hat do versus what you are responsible uh, for running. So if, if you have the servers, if you have to do a lot of the networking, those are pieces that on a day-to-day -day, regular basis, your team is responsible for maintaining. Whereas if you consume OpenShift as a managed offering, you're just really interacting with the API itself and the, the administration console. We take care of all of those pieces and actually can have communication and collaboration a little bit to understand what you need to handle versus what we have. The way I typically describe it uh, is if you self-manage OpenShift yourself, you've got like 20 of those wonderful geek knobs and you can dial everything in exactly how, as you want it. If you consume OpenShift as a cloud service, it's more like five knobs and they're not nearly as finely grained. So there are still things that you can do. You are not locked into a specific configuration, but there needs to be things that our SRE team knows will be available in every cluster. Uh, Want to make sure that things like security are well taken care of, um, and you know, then there's there's there are things where there are flexibility. Um, that that brings us to just if we talk about the cloud in general, um, the cloud takes care of the the physical layer itself, but you are responsible for your application and when it's not just your application but typically if you've ever you know if you're the one building uh compute in the cloud you're responsible for logging making sure the identity is there making sure security settings and taggings and all of those pieces are there um there's uh people i know in the security space they talk about there's the shared responsibility model there's also a shared irresponsibility model in the public cloud so from a networking standpoint the default on the cloud is that firewall is open you will need to set all of your firewall settings well if that somehow is overlooked you could be open to uh, some real uh, catastrophic hacking uh, on that environment when you leverage openshift and as a cloud service there's much of that that we take care of uh, for you. So I don't need to think about some, some of the basic operating system and networking configuration things because uh, our SRE team will manage that and you can spend much more of your time, as I've said, about the application and the overall uh, governance uh, and compliance uh, type of activity there. Um, to give a customer example. So here is a bank uh, that, that was actually using the Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS. Um, and one of the things you typically see uh, when you talk about adopting Kubernetes and going through this is how does it accelerate my overall uh, development and deployment of new software capabilities? So down on the results, you'll see application delivery time went from 25 minutes it wasn't bad to really near instant. Uh, when we talk about scalability and automation, Kubernetes is built for automation uh, and we can really manage a lot of those. We need to be able to change from being driven by people to allowing the software and automation from a holistic standpoint to deal, deal with much more. Um, and not only do we move faster, but it, it, as one of those strong patterns from DevOps, uh, we can actually move faster while improving security because if we think about security through the entire process we can make sure that it's not just a bolt-on or something that could be overlooked but something that we we all work together uh, to make sure we take care of up front uh, a little bit more for the bank itself um, one of the things that they wanted to do of course is leveraging uh, from aws there are so many services that they want to take advantage of so since our our software just runs on the compute layer of the cloud itself, and we're not doing anything unique at that layer. Most of the services that run in the public cloud 
are still able to be used. There are certain things where the cloud does the entire full stack, uh, what, what we've typically called PaaS in the past, um, or the, certain offerings that they have, but most of the services itself run on the compute that we have. So as it notes here, uh, some of the database and analytics uh, and mobile and networking applications work very well uh, in a ROSA environment. So uh, this bank uh, helped move a lot of their clients onto the platform. They helped accelerate what they're doing. They increase overall adoption, overall customer satisfaction goes up, and they're ready to be able to take advantage of new things when they come out and be able to respond to their internal and ultimate customer demands uh, much faster than they had before. So I've spent more of my time talking about uh, the, the cloud and the cloud services. Of course, what we do at Red Hat uh, expands across all of the environments, the consistency that we can provide, whether you're in the data center, a physical environment, running on virtual machines, in many of the public clouds or at the edge. OpenShift lives in all of those environments. We just have the flexibility of having either you run the software or our cloud services where we've seen a lot of growth. I've talked at what we, we call the platform layer. Hopefully during this event, you'll also have some time to hear about some of the application and data services that we have, really things that help accelerate how you build applications. Uh, things like the API management have been quite successful for a number of times. Uh, the database world, we have one called OpenShift Database Access that will help your developers have to think a little bit less about which database they are plugging into and a number of other services, as well as uh, many of those have equivalents that can be run uh, in a data center itself. So I really want to thank you for joining me. Again, my name's Stu Miniman. I'm very easy to find. If you have any questions on OpenShift, uh, please reach out to me uh, through the, some of the social media platforms. I do lots of presentations for, 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 for Red Hat and some of our partners. Uh, I, I attend many of the industry conferences, things like KubeCon, uh, which is the CNCF's uh, flagship show, KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, uh, as well as uh, some Amazon shows. So once again, thank you so much for joining me on this session and want to wish you the best of luck on your journey and definitely hope that Red Hat can help you along that way. All right, Stu is always entertaining and informational, as I said at the outset. Uh, really enjoyed having you on today, Stu. Thanks for um, for just informing us in, in such a uh, complete and clear way. Um, Stu, for those of you who don't know, has a background uh, as an analyst and is uh, is someone well known in the industry. And Red Hat is is lucky to have him. Uh, thanks for that fascinating dive into the cloud, into uh, DevOps, and all those things that are going on. Um, so what a great presentation. Before we wrap up today, though, we have one more piece of business for you, and we that is the Amazon gift card prize drawing. As I mentioned at the outset, you do have to be present for the entire event to be eligible for the gift card, and we have got a winner today, and that winner is Jacques Brace from Nevada. Congratulations to you, Jacques. We will be in touch with you to get you your card. Um, and with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank Red Hat for making this event possible. And folks, uh, we're done. I hope you enjoyed being here. I certainly enjoyed being uh, on with you. Thanks for attending, for all your great questions, um, and for spending a part of your day with us. That concludes today's event. I will uh, see you in the next one. So long, everyone.